Hello, my name is Nick Shahadi from the University of Pittsburgh, and today I'm going to present to you my research titled The Forelimb Representation in Primary Motor Cortex and Dorsal Premotor Cortex is Partially Activated in Response to Reach Degress Movements of Rhesus Macaques. We perform a variety of coordinated forelimb movements in our day-to-day -day lives, such as grabbing for a cup of coffee or texting or brushing our teeth. Uh, and the overarching goal of this project is to understand how the brain encodes uh, coordinated forelimb movements such as these. Frontal motor areas are responsible for controlling forelimb movements. Um, and if we look at our macaque brain here, some of those areas include M1, primary motor cortex, PMD, dorsal premotor cortex, and PMB, which is ventral premotor cortex as they're labeled here. And within these frontal motor areas, there's an organized topography such that different parts of the body are represented. We can think of Penfield's homunculus, where along the strip of the central sulcus, where primary motor cortex is, different parts of the brain are going to be responsible for eliciting different types of movements. So we have um, a cartoon version of how the forelimb is represented in both M1 and PMD here on the right. And we see the hand in primary motor cortex is represented in the central core along the central sulcus, surrounded by the arm. And then in PMD, you primarily get arm responses with a little bit of hand responses that are located in the caudal medial corner of PMD. So the question that we want to ask for this current project is how is neural activity that supports coordinated forelimb movements organized in relation to the anatomical motor map in M1 and PMD? So here's an example of monkey one's motor map with the distal forelimb or the hand representation in the dark gray pixels and the proximal forelimb or the arm representation in the light gray pixels. So we could have the scenario in which there's just general activation of both M1 and PMD, or we could have a case where there's discriminant activation in M1 and PMD where there's certain domains that are being activated and not the entire region. So how are we going to sample the entire forelimb representation in M1 and PMD without being biased and without missing any potential activity. So we're gonna use brain imaging. Now there are previous works that have imaged neural activity while primates have performed coordinated forelimb movements, but they've used imaging techniques such as fMRI, which has two cores of the spatial resolution to capture the differentiation between the arm and the hand representation in M1 or PMD, and two photon microscopy, which has too fine of a spatial resolution to comprehensively sample both the arm and hand representation in M1 or PMD. So we are going to use intrinsic signal optical imaging, or ISOI, which has the appropriate spatial resolution to differentiate activity in both the arm and hand representation in M1 and in PMD. So to briefly get into the methods, we are using intrinsic signal optical imaging, which is going to shine red light on cortex, which has been exposed via craniotomy and neuronomy. And we're going to record the intrinsic signal change using a CCD camera, which is capturing frames at a rate of 10 hertz. And because of their extinction coefficients in red light wavelengths, deoxyhemoglobin will absorb more red light than hemoglobin which means that an increase in deoxyhemoglobin, which is an indicator of neural activity, will read as darker pixels in the frames. Due to the visibility of cortex, we have a reference to the blood vessel map, and we can use that blood vessel map to place electrodes along various locations in M1 and PMD and use intracortical microstimulation to evoke movements to define a detailed motor map. We have two rhesus macaques that are trained to perform a reach to grasp task in which the monkeys are required to reach and grab either a small sphere, which will elicit a precision grip, a large sphere, which will evoke a power grip, and just reach for a photosensor and not grab it. So there's a condition in which there is no grasp. So to give you an idea of what these results are gonna look like, here is a video in which we have the monkey performing the reach to grasp task on the left, and then we have the corresponding intrinsic signal optical imaging frames shown on the right. In the later frames, there's an increase in the negative reflectance change, which again is indicating this increase in deoxyhemoglobin and an increase in neural activity is shown in the red pixels. And we're gonna play it again, and you can see that those red pixels aren't gonna show up until the monkey has completed movement. So let's see how we got there. So first we're just gonna look at results from one single session. And here we're looking at the condition in which the monkey reached to grasp for the large sphere, thus evoking a power grip. And you can see the behavior above the frames in this colored timeline where these different colors are indicating different phases of the trial. And again, you can see that this increase in the red pixels, which is the increase in the negative reflectance change or indicator of increased neural activity, don't show up until these later frames starting around four seconds after the monkey received the go cue or about 1.2 seconds after the monkey completed movement. And from around about 4.7 seconds after cue onset to the end of the trial, the pixels start to saturate. And had we imaged for longer, we would see those pixels return to their baseline values at the withhold condition in which the monkey isn't going to move at all. And we can see that we do not get that increase in negative reflectance change. So let's focus on these later frames where the pixels have become darker but have not saturated yet. So if we average the frames 4.1 to 4.6 seconds after go cue and compare them to the frames in the baseline before the monkey received the cue onset, we can perform a t-test um, in the left tail to get pixels that are darker, which are shown for the power grasp as the dark gray pixels. Or in the withhold, we look at the right tail and see pixels that got brighter in the dark gray pixels. And we can also monitor the reflectance change over time in the trial um, by averaging their values in these regions of interest, which are indicated in these colored circles in both the withhold condition and in the power grass condition. And after acquiring pixels that are significant in this brain range for each individual session, we can combine across sessions by aggregating the activity maps on top of each other, um, using the blood vessel mask to uh, align them to each other, and we can set a threshold to know where there are active pixels in at least four sessions for each of these conditions, and that's what's shown here.
So we quantified where activity was in relation to the arm and hand in both M1 and PMV. And the total surface area of the forelimb representation is reported above the bar graphs for M1 and PMD separately. And you can see it even in your most maximally activated condition that you're getting such a small portion of the arm and hand representation that is active to support reach to grass movement. However, was the time range that was used to generate activity maps actually appropriate to capture all possible domains that appear um, in the t-test? So in order to circumvent this issue, we implemented K-MediaWorks clustering on the reflectance change time course of these tiles that are represented um, in this grid that's overlaid on top of the field of view. Um, so you know, for each of these tiles, we're gonna get a reflectance change that may look like this or it may look like this. And we're gonna do K-MediaWorks clustering, which uses um, a correlation coefficient metric to determine the distance between points to determine the optimal number of clusters and group these tiles based on that clustering. So here are the average frames from all eight sessions in that frame range that we use to generate the T-type. Um, that are shown here. And we can look at the k medioids clustering and see that they actually match the significant pixels from the t-tests very well. Um, so the clustering colors don't represent anything, they just represent different groupings. And we can look at the average time course of all the tiles within this cluster, and we can see that the red cluster indeed does have this increase in negative reflectance, while the yellow grouping seems to have tiles that have an increase in positive reflectance. So to summarize, how is neural activity that supports coordinated forelimb movements organized in relation to the anatomy? The arm and hand representation in M1 and PMD is partially activated in response to reach to grass, specifically around 14% of both the arm and the hand in M1 and around 25% of the arm and the hand in PMD. And looking into the future, successful use of ISOI for experiments in which the subject is moving will allow mesoscale imaging study motor function like we did here, but it can be implemented in other brain areas or to record cortex during different behavioral tasks. And the visible access of cortex for intrinsic signal optical imaging allows us to co-register imaging results with electrode recording since we have access to that blood vessel map to record the location of the electrode and then cross-reference these results. Uh, thank you, and I look forward to your questions.